There are many reasons why Britain has become a movie-making mecca. There's all that creative talent we're famous for, not forgetting the legendary studios behind some of the biggest films of all time. But what you might be less aware of is the number of stunning silver screen locations we've got too, some of which are actually just down the road. I'm Ali Plum and this is the Film Fan's Guide 2. Durham. This is Durham Cathedral, and this is Hedwig, I think, I hope. Anyway, 900 years ago, when construction began here, little did the monks know that it would become a massive blockbuster movie location, because again, they were monks, and it was 900 years ago. Isn't that right? Yes, it is. It is right. It's a perfect fit for everyone's favourite school of witchcraft and wizardry, thanks in part to its imposing towers and halls on site that could double for Hogwarty classrooms. The cathedral here is a real-life Hogwarts, almost literally. When the Wizarding World first hit cinemas back in 2001, it was one of several locations that doubled for the school, alongside Gloucester Cathedral, Annick Castle in Northumberland, and Laycock Abbey in Chippenham. And this spot, known as the Cloister Garth, I have to presume the font of Wayne is somewhere nearby, was the setting for one of Harry and Hedwig's most iconic moments in the Philosopher's Stone. Here we go, come on. Here we go. The cloister has featured in several key scenes in the series, including one of the most disturbing. Forget the Dementors, watching Ron vomit up slugs will truly haunt me forever. Obliviate! It's not working. Now I feel stupid. This is Durham Cathedral's nave. You might recognise it from Songs of Praise, or perhaps more likely, considering this is a film fan's guide to, from deftly doubling as good old Asgard, Thor's Thorma home in that mightiest of superhero smackdowns, Avengers Endgame. And despite what you might have thought, they didn't have to do much to make it more Thor, because as you can see, it's already thoroughly Thorsome. They just put a green screen at the end of that Corothor, and uh, that was enough to transform it. Was that Thor or five? Anyway. It's not just mythical royalty that's paced past these picturesque pews. Durham Cathedral has also hosted real-life royalty too, sort of, with Hollywood royalty Kate Blanchett playing real-life royalty in Elizabeth, 1998's Codpiece, Corsets and Crowns epic. The nave and its much-loved, effortlessly regal pillars featured heavily in the film, including when Liz One had a near-miss with a would-be assassin, played by James Bond-to-be, Daniel Craig. Yet to get ye license to kill fully sorted out then, I guess. Who are you? You will declare yourself to me. It's me, Ali Plum. I interviewed you for Ocean's Eight, amongst other things. <sighs> Honestly, you think you make a connection with somebody and then, and then you realise you're just another interview guy. Oddly, Elizabeth isn't the only film shot in County Durham to feature botched assassinations on royalty of yore. This is the amazing Beamish Living Museum of the North, used plenty on screen over the years thanks to its painstaking attention to historical detail and beautifully preserved Edwardian charm. Most recently, it played the role of York in 2019's Downton Abbey Damn Movie, where them over at the big house get all in a tiz about King George V coming to town. We see Beamish a few times, first when a mysterious major puts out feelers to recruit an assassin's apprentice, like some kind of murderous Lord Sugar, and then when the Downton kitchen staff head out to get groceries fit for a king. The great thing about Beamish is that when you follow in those glitzy, filmy footsteps, you don't actually need to imagine what it was like once the set designers had done their magic. It looks like this all the time. I would buy some of this awesome produce, but uh, I guess it's probably about 100 years past its sell-by date. Still, it was lovely to pop in. From butlers to ballet, this is Easington Colliery, a small mining town just the other side of Durham from Beamish. It played the role of Everington in 2000's crowd-pleasing smash hit Billy Elliot. 
the film continued the grand British tradition of social realism with a musical edge. Let's not forget the Full Monty and Brast Off as well, where the unlikely protege toe taps his way home, delighted he's finally mastered the pirouette. Well, as you can see, he's not the only one. OK, I'm going to stop that now, partly because I don't want to show off, and yes, even though I could have pirouetted the entire mile or so from Everington to here, well, it's easy if you use the magic of Hollywood geography, because I've gone from County Durham to the distant prison planet of Fiorina 161, and I'm pretty sure dancing is frowned upon there. This is Blast Beach. Thanks, and I use the word thanks very loosely there, to millions of tons of colliery waste that darkened it in days gone by, its blackened shoreline and stained cliffs provide the perfect backdrop to open David Finch's Alien 3, if you're watching the right cut, that is. All post-production had to do was add some coal mine inspired machinery, and you've got the perfectly set terrifying tone. Following a notoriously troubled production, the sequence was, like all that waste, dumped from the final film. The editor, Terry Rawlings, later commented that the sequence had contained many elements crucial to setting up the story, so it isn't just a magnificent locale, it also strangely sums up all those problems with the Alien 3 Corp. Thankfully, the beach was reinserted into the beginning of the 2003 extended edition, which for some fans is the definitive version of Alien 3, and it is much closer to Fincher's original vision. And Fincher isn't the only director who's been drawn to this dramatic stretch of mining coastline, less than 10 miles away. Is Blackall Beach, the setting of the final scenes of British classic Get Carter. Back then the beach was also totally black, covered in coal spoils which, as seen in the film, were dumped by a conveyor system that's since been removed. It's at the appropriately named Black Hall that Kane's Carter catches up with a crook who killed his brother, having chased him from North Blythe in Northumberland, that's 35 miles away, to here on the county Durham coast. Director Mike Hodges has described how when he discovered the beach, it was a vision of hell. But when he came to film, it was actually a bright sunny day, so he had to wait around until it was suitably grey and overcast to shoot the scenes. Imagine that, not being able to film by the North Sea because the weather was too good. But once the light had dipped, the final shots were suitably grim and haunting, as is of course Jack's fate on the blackened shore, creating one of the all-time greatest British cinema moments. Of course though, it wasn't nearly as grim or as haunting as the Sylvester Stallone remake, which was nominated for Worst Film, Worst Director, Worst Actor and Worst Sequel at the 2000 Stinkers Bad Movie Awards. My name is Jack Carter and you don't want to know me. You're not wrong. And on that note, that's it for the Film Fan's Guide to Durham. What a stunning part of the world this is. It's no wonder that movie makers have been so keen to come. Make sure you check out the films we featured, and next time you're in the area, maybe dance up and down the street like a total idiot, because it is highly recommended. In the meantime, thank you, as ever, for watching, and I'll see you for the next one.